Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Full Time Whistle Podcast. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by former Manchester United and Wigan Athletic defender Pat McGibbon. First and foremost, Pat, how are you doing? Yeah, all's good, yeah, all's good over here. Uh, well, it's not great today, but uh, generally all's good. That's great to hear. And uh, for those who don't know, where are you based at the moment? So I'm, I'm back home in Northern Ireland, so I'm in, in Lurgan, which is about 30 miles from Belfast. So um, I had sort of, I think it was 2002, once I finished with my, my working career, moved back home with my wife, who's from here as well. So we've settled back in and well settled now. That's uh, great to hear. And so first and foremost, to set the scene, I like to it for all podcast guests. Uh, what was your childhood like growing up in Northern Ireland? Um. Look, my childhood was it always revolved around sport. You know, it was a lot of a lot of sport went on, especially, you know, from primary school right through. Um I lived out in the countryside, so we had quite a big backyard and you know, from my earliest memories I was out kicking a ball. So growing up, I suppose between from about nine upwards, I was playing a lot of a lot of sports. So the in the, the school that I was in, it was mainly Gaelic sports. So I played Gaelic football primary school and then when I went into secondary school I did Gaelic I, I played soccer I played I did cross country running did basketball yeah to be honest and then everything that, that was going on a lot of it revolved around um, sport still you know concentrated a wee bit on school as well but um, generally it was always a, a big big part of what I did I want to take the opportunity uh, while I can but with Gaelic football can you maybe explain a bit more about that for the viewers who may not know about it yeah, look, Gaelic football is it's a sport. There's Gaelic and Harlan. Harlan was played with a bat, but the Gaelic is just played with, with the ball. And it's it's pretty much a size five football, but it would be a bit heavier, I suppose, than the, the footballs that are used in the soccer. So um, it's 15 players. Um, a lot of it's sort of man to man and man marking but you know you, you use a ball and you kick the ball out of your hands as opposed to really off off the ground um but it's a physical sport but very fast moving sport and i have to say it, it you know it, it taught me a lot as a grind and you know even in the in the soccer as well so i loved the growing up uh, our schools played a lot of of gaelic sport and i was always i suppose we had always fairly, fairly successful teams within that as well so it's something even when I came back in 2002, I actually played a bit of Gaelic sport again for, for a few years before I retired. It's always really interesting. And obviously, for your background of sport throughout school, uh, you obviously fell in love with football. And who were your idols in football growing up? Um, well, as a, as a kid growing up, I would probably be Alan Hansen and, and Kenny Douglas. I was a Liverpool supporter growing up. Um, a lot of my friends were, were the same. Um, and they would have been the ones that, that you know, even, even from a very early age, my mum and dad would have bought me like Shoot Magazine, Match Magazine, Roy the Rovers. And, and that's where the whole, you know, affiliation with football generally is sort of built and, and the dream started. So, you know, people like Brian Robson always remember even, you know, my first when I first went in the, the, the cliff and seeing Brian Robson, who was England captain, for the first time, I just loved football generally, you know, and I always had this dream that I just wanted to get paid for something I loved doing. When did you realise in your early life that you was really good at football and obviously had that potential to make it professionally? And I, I always knew I had a, a bit of ability, you know, but like a lot of people at school, you know, I, I, I was one of the better players, you know, within school, but there were better players probably, you know, at the early age than, than myself. But I suppose the difference was I I just loved going and, and training. And, you know, if it wasn't with my mates, if it wasn't, you know, on a, on a pitch, then I was training out on my own and just kicking a ball. Sometimes it was, you know, even in the early stages as, as, a, as a kid, 15, 16 years of age, whenever I had a, had a poor game on a Saturday, I went straight out. And, and kick the ball again. It was more to get as much to get frustration out as anything else. But also, what it does was, what it did was, it gave me more practice time, I suppose. So, um, always knew I had a bit of ability. But I think my attitude and application, I think, were big, big parts to play and and me actually making a career for myself. What parts of your attitude and application really stands out for you looking back? Um, 
I suppose, as, as I say, it was it's just putting in putting in the time in terms of the the practice. You know, I, I, I made sure that um, you know I was careful before four games. You know, when I was younger and just wasn't going out or and things like that. Uh, but it was more surrounding the amount of practice time that I put in, and, and I suppose that that was what developed the skills there more than anything else. Absolutely, it's the classic saying: "Practice makes perfect." And obviously, in your case, uh, the application, the training you did outside of football, in addition to playing, really stood you in good stead. And during your youth days, you uh, you signed for your local team, Porter Down, in, in 1991. Uh, how did that opportunity come about, and how much did you enjoy playing for Porter Down? Yeah, again, I, I was I was at a team learning United just a local side. So there was about five, maybe six of us all went from the same team over to Port Adown at the same time. So that was probably a help. You know, you would you more or less half your your team were moving over to Port Adown. Now even at 16, 17 years of age, I would have you know, I was struggling to get into the Port Adown youth team at that stage. I wasn't particularly tall. Um for a centre back, and you know there were lads that were maybe a year younger than me, Jay, yeah, that were actually getting in the team ahead of me at youth team age. But in my final year, then at, at 18, 17, 18, I took growth spurt, and and you know all of a sudden things, as well as obviously you know we had a bit of ability, my confidence grew in terms of the physicality. So um, that's where it, it really took off then, and and as you say, I signed for Porter Down, and. Um, in my final year, I poured it down at 18. I was I was captain of the youth team. I was in the reserve team and and, um, and on the fringes of the first team, and also playing for the Northern Ireland schools under 18s and captain them in that year. So everything just seemed to to, to click at the one time around sort of 17, well 18 actually. When you was a younger player, and you mentioned there that there may have been players that were younger than you getting opportunities ahead of you. How important was it to maintain your confidence and obviously keep believing your own ability uh, that the chance will come? And obviously the growth spurt would have uh, been a massive help because obviously you was uh, quite an imposing centre-back during your, your heyday as a player. Yeah, um, the, you know, the, 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 the biggest one within all of this, I mean, because we talked about sort of confidence and and. You know, you, you can have a competency and you can you can have an ability, but you, you football, a lot of it, and even, you know, all the lads that, that have been on these podcasts before, as much as, you know, we make a professional career for ourselves, you know, you still have moments where you you, you, you lose confidence a wee bit or you're not getting a, a good run. So that's where the resilience comes in. And the one thing about me was I always had that, I suppose, stubbornness, you know, the 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 to make sure that I would I would succeed and and you know it wasn't to say that I was a good games or that I was better than than some of the other lads at the, the team but I always had that resilience in terms of um keep going you know that and, and which is something that I obviously bring into the mental health sphere as well it's that whole thing of try 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 again absolutely and who taught you to have this uh, level of confidence and obviously self-belief was it was it your parents or other influences yeah, I think I think the, the biggest influence would be my dad, you know, throughout because when he he was the one that followed me to games, you know, he didn't he didn't manage, he didn't, um, you know, he he just was very quiet, just sat watched games, you know, if it if it a good game, he'd say, you know, things like well done, but you know maybe you, sh- you could work on this, or if it a poor game, he didn't didn't get onto my back about it, so. But because of that, you always I always had somebody that was was basically mentoring as well as be, obviously being my dad. You know, also at really good coaches, the lad or a, a manager, Dazzy McGuinness, Bunker was was renowned around the, the area, but even throughout Northern Ireland as being a great youth coach. And and Dazzy was one of my coaches along with you know a, a few others during my, my time growing up at Lurgan United. So. I was very fortunate that way. I had good mentors, right? As a young lad, how receptive were you to uh, advice from coaches, your parents, and things of that nature? Because I know some footballers may be quite reluctant to take advice, uh, but what some people are more than happy to obviously act upon criticisms in many ways and, and turn them into from a strength. Turn sorry, turn them from a weakness into a strength. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, I would say that was probably one of my strongest points is that it was an, an active listener. It was a good listener, and uh, you know, and I observed. I didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily, you know, show a lot in terms of even when I was growing up. I wasn't a big talker, and I wasn't uh, wasn't a shower. I was more about you know actively listening and observing, which I think is an important skill, you know, in both both in football and, and also within the area of mental health as well, because um really there's some people that just go and 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 I'm sure I've seen very natural footballers, you know, like I mean certainly Paul Scholes is the best player I I've played with and and he was just a natural footballer, Paul, but there there are others that have to work and the majority have to work at it, yeah. So it's the same with this and that's that's one thing that I, I would say that I've always been good at, at listening and, and observing rather than talking. You know, I think there's a time for talking, but, you know, when you're growing up and you're trying to, to make a career for yourself, it's far more important to listen to people. I think absolutely that that is so spot on because it's so important in not just football, but in general life to listen. And obviously we'll touch upon mental health later on because we'll uh, we'll have a good section on that because some of your work that you've been doing uh, in Northern Ireland is very inspirational towards mental health. And uh, I think one of the big things people associate yourselves with is uh, Manchester United. Can you talk about how that opportunity first came about in early 1992? I'm sure you won't get bored of telling this story. Yeah, look, I, I was in my final year at, at, at Port of Iron, so I was playing within the youth team. And, and as I said, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd grown in confidence, you know, I'd grown in height and grown in confidence. And, and was, was, I knew that I was, I was playing well. But um, about, I think, three weeks previously, or a few weeks previously, um, the manager of Port of Iron had pulled me and said that Port Vale were interested in bring me over on trial. And that fell through. Um, so then I was playing a reserve game and after the game I was called in to, to Ronnie McCall's uh, changing room and he said he basically said there's a fellow who wants to speak to you and it was Eddie Coulter who would have been the, the chief scout at Manchester United and, and Eddie told me that Manchester United then wanted to, to bring me over on trial so I um, went over for a week and after the week we, we played, I actually played a reserve game. I, I thought I would just play at a youth game, Jay, because I was still youth team age. But they stuck me straight into the reserves against Aston Villa. And I was marking Dwight York and, and Dalian Atkinson, God rest them. So, you know, it was a baptism of fire. But I must have did well enough to, to then be offered another trial for three weeks in that summer. And that's where after that that three week trial in the summer, then they offered me a three year deal. So it was obviously you know it was a dream come true. What was the moment like for you that one of the most successful clubs in England wanted to sign you? Oh look, I mean as I say, it was dream dream come true. You know, I know it's a cliche, but truth of the matter was, uh, you know, I always, as I say, I dreamed of being a footballer, but also worked towards being a footballer. Well, you can you can dream all you want, but if you don't put the the practice in then you know it's not gonna turn into reality so it was just it was just something else as I said the, the moment I walked in the the cliff for, for training it was just it was one of those where I, I wanted to you know I wanted to push to make sure that I had a career for myself within the game. Do you recall your first ever day at Manchester United training? Yeah I remember the first day even on, on trial when I initially went it was at the cliff and Turned up. I was um, I was picked up by the the kit man at the time from the airport and was brought to the cliff and trained with reserves that morning under Jim Ryan. So, uh, but I remember just walking into the cliff and it's it's quite an old training ground, but you know the pitch outside is is the perfection and we trained out on it, you know, and it was just um, seeing seeing all the names that you only ever seen on TV or in the in the newspapers, you know, and all the first team stars, um, that just give me a real real taste of it. Absolutely, there's so many star city names. And speaking of star city names, do you remember your first ever meet with Sir Alex Ferguson? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the 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 first meeting, and that there was a he, he had obviously his his room within the cliff, you know, so. We just had a chat about things generally. Um, he was he was always, I have to say, you know, during the five years that I knew he, he was great because whenever you know you needed to have a, a chat at some stage, 
they, um, you know, the, the door was always open. And as much as, yes, he was very good from a, you know, from a football point of view, he was also very good from a, from a management point of view as well. How was his management skills? Because I know um, from previous interviews and, and previous things I've watched uh, on the wider football community, he's very personal and he's someone that looks out for, for his players and their families too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, especially with the younger, you know, with the younger kids as well, he, he, he makes sure that they're, you know, they're looked after and he makes sure that, they, you know, they're, they can concentrate on the football. So when it comes to, you know, like I was going over from, from Northern Ireland and obviously you're, you're going in the, the, you go from being a small or a big fish in a small pool to all of a sudden be a, a tiny fish in a massive pool. So with that, you know, comes not just the, you have a certain amount of time on the, the training pitch and on the field and matches, but you've also a lot of time spent off it, you know, so you have to make sure that there's, you know, there's things to do. And the gaffer was really good when it came to that. You know, the, the, the gaffer and, the, and the, the club generally are very good at sort of looking after the players. Um, I think even more so now, but I think... Um, with with academies, there's a lot of, I suppose, learning beyond the the football pitch, you know, and I suppose looking after the welfare of players as well. Absolutely. And uh, what was the transition like for you to migrate to England uh, as a very young footballer? Oh, look, I mean, uh, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not saying it was easy. I suppose I was as probably a little bit um, more fortunate in that. I was I was up a bit more mature, so I was I was eighteen at the time. You know, you've players going over the likes of Keith Gillespie. Keith w- went over at sixteen years of age, whereas I went over after my A levels. Yeah, so I was probably I got my A levels under my belt, and I was you know a wee bit more mature that way. But homesickness kicks in. There's no doubt about that, um, and it's something that you have to you have to overcome. You know, and especially again, there's a lot of players that would tend to go over to England and then come back fairly soon after. You know, and I don't think we can cope with being away from home. Uh, it's not that um, it was easy, but again, those are the sacrifices that you have to make. Absolutely. And in terms of obviously moving away and moving to England, uh, how much did you miss your family? Because I know you are quite a big family man. Yeah, look, it was, a, it was definitely a ranch. Um the you know my, my wife and I burned out like we we were going together even from school, so burned out would have come over every three or four weeks and and my mum and dad would have come over, um the the watch reserve games or just to come over for a weekend, so I always had that you know had that contact so I was never that far away and and I think in the first year or two, yeah I, I would maybe have went home for maybe five times a year so it so it broke it up anyway um, and I think that's that was important especially in the first couple of years absolutely because it's always good to find the right balance and obviously you don't know obviously go home too much in many ways because you don't want to get unsettled and, and reach the point where you, you're feeling like you want to stay back in Northern Ireland because you miss those home comforts yeah yeah look I mean I, I know we, we've you know we've spoken about it off screen before but obviously you know with the charity we're trying to be smart a lot of it surrounds my, the, the death of my brother through through suicide and that was in my first year at, at Manchester United as well so I had to go back home as part of that and um, you know at the time the club were were very good the, the, the gaffer was very good and said look take as much time as you, you need but what, what I found was that when I was home, a lot of my mates were, were actually away at a university at that stage or they were working. So, yeah, so it, it wasn't going to be the same anyway. So I found that, you know, the sooner I got back and, and back into normality and trying to make a career for myself was was the best thing to do. You know, so um, so that, that was important. You know, so if you again, it's just making you have to make that sacrifice. I understand it's a really sensitive subject, but may I ask you about your brother, Philip, and obviously how that obviously shaped you as a young footballer and, and, and your life as well, because I can't imagine how it felt, how it must have felt to, to lose your brother at such a young age. He was only 18 or 19 at the time. Yeah, yeah, I, I was 18 and, and um, 
Philip was Philip was a year older, so I was nineteen and Philip was twenty. Um, so growing up, obviously we both played in the the same teams. He was a year older, but we played in the, the Gaelic teams together with Clan Earn and um, r- right up the the senior level. Um, and you know, I always remember even that I, I think I came home not long before Philip's death, and we we went up to the local park and just kicked the ball about. You know, so we're always very close. We're typical brothers. We, you know, we fought and fought at times, but, um, but there was a, you know, there was a close bond there. So obviously, it was a, it was a big, big ranch. So obviously, when I, when I heard and and had to come home and, and deal with that. It was a, a really tough period for you. And uh, in, in terms of when you lost your brother, did you, your mindset approach to football change? Yeah, I, I, my mindset, uh, it did change in, in a way, I suppose. It, I, I wouldn't have noticed it at the time, but I suppose what, and it's, this is probably why I'm in this area of within mental health day as well, is that um, I was always, growing up, I was always captain to the teams that I played in, so I was, uh, I was I assume people seen leadership skills in me. Um, so whenever, obviously, Philip's Day had happened, you know, even on the pitch or within training, and if somebody was reacting in a certain way and it wasn't normal, you know, I maybe I would have picked up on it. You know, now, um, but as a footballer, you're trying to, you, you've got that thing surrounding, you have to be quite selfish, you know, because you have to work very hard in order to maintain staying in the first team or staying within a within a squad at, at a such a big club like Manchester United. So. But I, but I do think that those things surrounding empathy and, you know, were, were things that probably changed after Philip's death because we never, and I never seen it, seen it coming. Absolutely, and it, it must have been so tough. And obviously with your work with Train to Be Smart, how important has it been for you to, to use your experiences to potentially help another family who, who might be going through the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the biggest one is that, you know, it's about non-judgment, you know, and I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it. Obviously, with the charity, we have affiliated teams and we have kids and, and the whole idea is just to try and get them to reach their own potential, you know, and, and the, the, the biggest one is that they're not all going to become footballers, you know, and that, that's not the idea. The idea is that you give them other wee skills within that. You know, and as I say, things like empathy and, you know, just being a leader and and communication skills and, you know, being positive in your outlook, all of those things, which can be brought not just to within football, within a team environment, but also within a workplace, within your social um, aspect, within your family life. These are all things that that can be worked on the same way as, as striking a ball with your right foot or your left foot can be worked on. It's the same with these you know character traits i fully agree because if you if you work hard enough to kind of improve a certain part of your life whether it's in, in football like you say working on that your right and left foot or or working on your social skills or working with your mental health it it's easily achievable and, and do you think philip will be proud of you and what you've achieved over the years not just in football but in mental health yeah look i mean i i, I do think that I like I came back home in 2002 and I had, I had a, you know, I had a clinical background and that I, I did my physio degree and that my intention was to go into physiotherapy work. But I found very soon after that, you know, I moved home that it just it was too clinical for me. And so it, it took a while from 2002 right to 2013 when I, I found or find it to be smart to realise, you know, that there was something else out there, you know, and I, I often say it, I think it was almost fate or Philip driving me and that, you know, this this area of mental health work where I was I was stuck for a while and what I was doing, it really brought me around to, to finding out what I was passionate again about because I was very passionate about football and playing, you know, and I was very focused on doing that and I just think for a while I was stuck. But, you know, having, having that learning and, and educating myself surrounding um, mental health I think that that was huge and also I think Phillips were driver and all this as well. Absolutely and in Northern Ireland um, was there any other resources for mental health or was it quite a new initiative to obviously involve mental health and sport combined in one to, to help improve people's uh, mental health and well-being? Yeah I, th- I mean uh, the, there's there's groups and organisations out there and there has been for 
for a long time, you know, both in Northern Ireland and, and beyond, you know, and, and who do great work in the area of mental health, you know, and surrounding, you know, anxiety, depression, self-harm, you know, the, the suicide. But within what we do, I think it's, as this moves on, it's about mental health education and giving people the small steps so that the, they're aware of it earlier. You know, and I, I often say at the, the young ages in particular, I think it's about inspiring the, the kids not to, to, to think too much about negative mental health, but to realise that mental health has existed from the day and hour that, that, that people were on this earth, regardless of your your belief system, um, that, that there's always been mental health. But it's the important thing is that you will have good days and bad days and how you overcome them. And uh, given this, given people the small steps and the, the, the children and young people the small steps to be able to cope with that is is hugely important. So that's where that's why I think what what the charity does and what what the teams do is you know is, is vital. With mental health, uh, obviously you're in quite a good position to speak about it now because I, I believe you've deployed in mental health. But do you think back in in your your playing days there was not really the same education and the same ideology about mental health uh, as it was in the modern day game? Uh, because obviously it's it's an issue where I thought I was asked to talk about it more openly. James Aspinall, a, a young wing athletic player, he did an interview with ITV News quite recently and talked about his experiences. I know uh, Kane Hemmings um, for, I think he's at First Albion at the moment. I think he did a, a recent article too. Yeah, the, the, there's there's no doubt that, you know, the, the, the education around mental health, there's, there's more of an awareness about it now. You know, I think it was... In, in my days, you know, at, at Manchester United in the early days, it was, a, um, you know, it was quite a personal thing, you know, and the, the, the people talk, you know, about the, the stigma surrounding mental health. It was just, it was just more personal, I think, at times. And, uh, but, but since then, I think people have started to realise that the more they share the experiences, the more people will realise, you know, that there's a, there's a support network, you know, and that they're, whilst they're, they're, um, experiences of mental health might be personal to them. There's still some common ground in which they can help, and people can help each other. You know, and, and with working in this area, I always say you don't have to be an expert, but you do have to cure. You know, and it's getting that that curing approach about uh, you know about being non-judgmental and just having an active ear to listen, being prepared to listen. I think is is hugely important. I mean, absolutely, I think with mental health, um, some people just want to have someone who will listen to them. And I think with mental health too, I, I'm sure you'll echo this, uh, it's always important to remember that the stigma, uh, which is the feelings associated to mental health, uh, to tackle that, you always have to remember um, that someone's mental health is only a very small part of them as a person. And you should not let that cloud your overall opinion of them because everyone goes through tough times, everyone goes through battles of adversity and struggles. And I think... We're at a stage now where we are slowly um, gaining a real understanding about mental health. And I think the sooner that we can tackle the stigma altogether, then we can really um, almost eradicate the mental health in a way. Because I think with the resources now, whether it's uh, Train to Be Smart, uh, Empathy Northwest, the Samaritans, Mind, there's so many great resources doing such great work to, to benefit people who may be struggling. Yeah, the, 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 there's no doubt. There's great, great support networks out there, and and you know that's um, that that can only be good, you know, because really, uh, I know the statistics are that, that one in four people, you know, adults within uh, will, will suffer from mental health issue at some point in their life. Now, in all honesty, I think it, it, it's more than that, you know, and and there's a lot of people out there that probably haven't spoken about, the, you know issues and, and those might be for a short period of time or they may be for a longer period of time jay in terms of anxiety and depression it's it's you know these mental health related issues so um but it's, it's making sure that, that that stigma is reduced and that the you know the shared experiences will will increase the i suppose the the awareness of of how you can help how you can self-help but also realize that if you are struggling that there's support from outside of, of yourself as well. Giving you knowledge and understanding about mental health, 
do you believe that the stigma attached to, to male mental health is a, a lot higher uh, in comparison to female mental health in terms of being willing to, to open up because of the traditional stereotypes attached to what back in back in the day where ideas how a man had to be alpha, he had to be manly, he had to be the masculine figure who if who if he showed emotions in any circumstance, it seems a weakness. Yeah, I mean I think I think it's getting it's getting the balance right because you know I've I've said this before. Um, you know, when I was used to as used to attend to room, you know, so whether that was at, at Ported Down as a as a kid or going through to Manchester United and then the Wigan Athletic, you know, the changing room was great because the the banter was there, you had a great social group as well. So I actually struggled whenever I stopped playing because you didn't have that connection and almost like your identity was lost to a certain extent. So you you always had that and and you know changing rooms are changing rooms and at times it can be <laughs> quite hostile environments and that and, and I mean that in, in a good way in that you know you, you you have to put up with with the banter and you'll get it sometimes and and then you'll give it out sometimes but that's that's part and parcel and that's what what why we love the football so much as well at times um but when it comes to the area of you know your your mental health and and actually not being able to speak about it a lot of the time you don't necessarily need to even be speak, be speaking about mental health but just being able to just have a chat can sometimes just lift your mood generally and that's why yes uh, the, the, you know and I'm, I'm certainly not saying that that these issues aren't real for for women as well you know um the, the, that mental health can affect anybody but i think sometimes women are more prepared to, to speak about it you know and speak about the personal things than what men are and as you say they, they maybe hold as bad as the things that are more personal to them to keep to keep them in you know and that's that's what can lead the sort of the more serious mental health surrounding you know self-harm suicide yeah absolutely i think that the traditional gender ideologies almost acts as a barrier in many ways in some cases towards men although although i, I believe um it is getting uh, to a stage where you can really open up about your mental health without the fear of being judged and, and that's really to see and obviously with the, gr- the great work you do train to be smart we'll we'll leave a link in the description as well for people to read up about what you offer and obviously get involved too, because I know you've got so many great projects going on. And I'd like to thank you so much for your honesty as well uh, to talk about Philip and obviously uh, Train to be Smart because it's obviously really brave for you to do that. I'd like to actually move back onto the football now. And uh, during your time at Manchester United, you moved up through the ranks and you was actually in the squad to go to Rotar for a grad for a, a UEFA Cup tie in the 1995-96 to season. Although you didn't play in Russia, how would you find the experience obviously travelling away and the camaraderie of going away on a European tour? Yeah, look, I mean, it was a, it was a great trip and it was great to see another part of the world. You know, I, I do always remember the, the hotel itself and I think it was, you know, it was probably one of the top <laughs> hotels, but it wasn't it wasn't great. And I always remember, like, I'm quite tall and six, almost six two, and I uh, remember my feet hanging outside the bed. I think it was about five foot six. So I don't, God knows what, what Gary Pallister was like, you know. So I, I was rooming with, with Kevin Pilkin at the time and, and Pilks would be, you know, one of my best mates within football. So um, it was it was just great to, to go over there and be part of that squad, um, especially when you, you look now at, you know, what a, what a successful squad it was. Obviously, I'd like to go and visit a new culture in Russia and obviously see what their environment's like and obviously what, what their culture is. I know the, the beds, the bed fitting weren't, weren't right for you, especially. Imagine if you went right now, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd actually just have the whole bottom half of your body hanging out. <laughs> Probably. That, that's the thing. I mean, I, I remember as well that that United actually brought their own chef as well, so they, they just cooked for them. It was mainly it was mainly just pasta, and that, but they brought their own chef. So, and and I remember the crowd it was was very partisan at the time. It was a very open stadium, um. But we we walked through Volgograd, at, at, and you know it was just amazing seeing the different buildings and you know the whole architecture compared to you know, what you were seeing back at home as well. Because growing up, my mom and dad always would have with 
brought us on holiday. So we, we, you know, we were probably fortunate that way. We we were quite open minded and and you know visited other countries abroad as well. So that gives you a good grinding. Absolutely, and it, it was still doing good stuff when you were traveling to these new places. It, although you didn't get Russia, sorry, although you didn't get on in Russia in the following game, you received your first team debut for United in the League Cup against York City. Is it fair to say that your first first game for, for Manchester United didn't go as you hoped? Yeah, I think I'd say that's probably an understatement, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> but like the, the, these these things are, are part and parcel of football. You know, I mean, I, I obviously made made my debut, and and it was you know it was a dream come true, and it was it was definitely you know my biggest highlight as well uh, within football to make my first team debut for Manchester United. Yeah, tried. Played alongside Pally and and um, basically in the second half the, the ball was played over the top and and we tried to play offside and it, it didn't happen so I had to chase back and chase back decided to to take the lad Paul Barnes down outside the box which you know all the evidence showed that it was outside the box but the referee decided to, to give a penalty and, and sent me off at the same time. And obviously it was a send it off. So it was very disappointing, you know, the gaffer um, give the, the team a rollick and, and myself a bit of a rollick and after the game. But I have to say the next day he brought me into his office and, you know, talked me through it and said, look, you know, these are parts and parcel of football. It's not the react, it's not the game. It's it's how you react it that's so important. So it definitely wasn't um, you know, it wasn't the, the best debut that's ever been had, but it's it's, it's part and parcel of, of football, especially at the top level. You have to take the rough with the smooth. What was it like to be on the uh, receiving end of the, the famous Sir Alex Ferguson hairdryer treatment? Yeah, look, I mean, pe- people ask about that, and, and yes, he, he had it in the, his locker, but the truth of the matter was, the Gaffer was a great educator, you know, so he, he, used, he used it at the right times in order to, to create a, a positive reaction from players so he knew, knew his players and he knew that he, he wanted to get the best of his players then sometimes he needed to use that so the, I, I had no issue with it I've not, not had an issue with it in football generally you know at Wigan Athletic had seven managers in my five years Jay, and they've all different you know they've all different personalities they've all different ways of management um, but I just took that as, you know, I've still to get on with my job and and um if if he needs to give me a rollick or anybody else then he's all he's trying to do is is get a positive reaction. Across the changing room, did certain approaches uh, not work? If this did the manager have to adapt different approaches to to handle different players because obviously some players may not react to the hair dry treatment, so to speak, in, in a way in which yourself might react to it. Yeah, look, I mean that, that that that's the thing, and and I know a, a few players have come out and said, you know, like the likes of Eric, like Aaron Cantona, they didn't, uh, that the gaffer wouldn't have said anything that that Derek in terms of you know uh, giving him a rollick, and but you know he, he just knew how to manage players. That that's the thing about it. And the other thing was, and and he'll admit this himself. You know, he he's the same. He's human, and he's off days himself. You know, but the one thing he was good at because. I think a recent story came out about, you know, with Scolzi and Scolzi playing a game against Newcastle. And I think Scolzi came on when they were 3-0 down and they ended up, they, they went back maybe to 3-2 three, three, or 3-3. Three, three. And eventually, you know, they lost 4-3 to Newcastle and Scolzi thought he did really well. And the gaffer gave him a rollick and as soon as he came into the changing rooms for giving the ball away. And I think Scolzi reacted, you know, back at him. But Scully says that the gaffer came to him on the Monday and apologised and said, you know, when I look back at it now. So even somebody as huge as, you know, Alex Ferguson was was human and he, he realised the, the same. And even, again, just being able to apologise is, is a big, big part of mental health. Absolutely. And it's always good to see that people are always willing to recognise that we are only human and we do make mistakes from time to time. And, with Sir Alex Ferguson, he is regarded as one of the greatest managers of all time. Would you fully agree with that? Oh, yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. You know, whenever you look at the success that he's had, um, that was, you know, it, it took a while. And I suppose in today's environment, you don't get time, 
you know, within management the same, but he, he was given the time to build, build a side, but um, in terms of his success, but also not just even at a first team level, he built a club, you know, he, he really did help to, to, to build a club. And I said the same about, you know, Wigan Athletic. I, I thought that there was a great fabric to the, the club and the, the, the gaffer helped to, to produce that and that, you know, the admin staff, the canteen ladies, the players, you know, he's seen them all as equals. And that, that was a big part of, of, you know, his success, I suppose. Absolutely. And while you only made one appearance at for Manchester United during your, your five years, uh, do you think the pedigree and mentality that you learned for the club so doing good stuff for the rest of your career. Yeah, it, it definitely did. I mean, I think that the, the biggest one for me was was the following year, 96, 97, because I'd still been on the fringes of, of the first team. And at, at the start of 96, 97, I played in the pre-season games with the first team with, with tour over in, in Ireland and played a couple of games there and then played in the Umbro International. Uh, tournament and then as the gaffer tended to do with the younger players he sent them out on low so I went out to, to, to Swansea but managed one game Jay, and then went in for a tackle and Manny went the, 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 the opposite way and all of a sudden at, at five and a half months out with, with two operations so uh, I, I was still on the fringes and, and I definitely think that I had a chance you know the the to build on what had happened. I don't think the, you know, the York game was any deciding factor in the amount of games that I actually played. I think that it was a final year was, was a difficult one because I then had to make a choice when I went out on loan to Wigan Athletic. Obviously enjoyed, you know, enjoyed my, my time on loan there. And the, the, the gaffer had offered me two years at United, but I just was at a crossroads where I had to make a decision that I, that I want to, to wait on the chance or did I want to go out and play regular first team football absolutely and in, in, in the we'll, we'll touch upon that uh, in, in due course but in the latter part of the 1996 to, to 97 season you did join Wing Athletic on loan and how did that move actually initially come about um I'd, as I said I'd, I'd, I'd just come back from injury I was out for five and a half months of, with in, in 96 97 and then I played a reserve game at, at Burley, Gig Lane, and after the reserve game, I think John Dean, John was at the match, and then I, I was called into the, the gaffer's office the following morning, and he says, like, you know, we're going to flat a car, would like you to go out on loan, and, you know, straight away, I was I was interested, because um, I'd, I'd got a very, I suppose, very small grasp of it from my, my game at, at uh, Swansea and going out on loan at Swansea so I wanted more of the competitive football as much as you're playing with really good players and, and Manchester United reserves it's not competitive you know it's not the same competition as playing league football uh, every every week so that's how it came about you know John Dean was at the game when, it, when I first came back from injury and then um, they took me on loan there When you arrived what were, the, what were your first impressions of the club? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I got on with, with the players from the club, you know, straight away. There's some really, really good lads, you know, the, the Roberto Martinez, Graham Jones, you know, were great lads, Kevin Sharp. There's so, so many of them, they were all, you know, they made me feel welcome from the start. And obviously, we were training at Christopher Park and, and uh, playing at Springfield. So, you know, the, the, we know that Springfield was not is not the JJB Stadium, but there was a, a you know there's a real feel in terms of the the support and the atmosphere when you were inside it. Um, so from from the start, I felt welcome and I felt at home there. You mentioned Roberto Martinez and Graham Jones. There, did you ever envision that they going to have the management careers they both have? Uh, yeah, you could you could see in terms of interpersonal skills with, with Robert, you know, that, that he was really good at, at managing the people and, and that he was, he was just genuinely a good, good person, you know, and he was a great lad. Bonner was, you know, Graham was uh, always into the coaching side of things, you know, even though he was playing, I think he had, he had did a um, uh, degree to do with, with teaching as well. So you could always see that, that that was happening. Obviously, they were good friends as well. So it, it just seemed to 
the work then as it went on, you know, as they finished their, their playing career and went into the coaching and management. Roberto Marti is a groom, Joe, is obviously will hold a, a very special place in the Athletic fans' hearts, and uh, as will you, because uh, in the, the, the 1996-97 season, uh, you made 10 appearances and you scored the goal that guaranteed Wigan's promotion to Division 2. How did you feel uh, when you scored the promotion clinching goal at home against Colchester? Yeah, look, I mean, it was a, it was a great night. I have to I have to say, it was it was a cold night, but um, it was it wasn't a great game, you know, and and it was one of those where probably one goal was going to win it, but fortunately enough, I got my head on the a, a corner from Robbie, and um, uh, you know, to score my first late goal, but also for that goal to be the goal that that clinched promotion, and you know, I'm not stupid enough to think that it was all about. Me, because the truth of the matter was, you know, I was coming in on loan, and the the group that had been there had did really well to get them in that position. But it was it was a brilliant night at a personal level, but also, you know, from at the club's level. And and luckily enough, we we pushed on, Jay, and and eventually won the league that season as well. Absolutely. And uh, what do you recall from the celebrations of that night and for the rest of the season where you went on to win the league? Yeah, like I mean, as I said before, the, both Manchester United and Wigan Athletic, both the, you know, I I was five years at both clubs, you know, so there was a great fabric to them, and I remember that that particular evening there was, you know, obviously the celebrations afterwards, walking around the pitch with the the, the supporters and just um, celebrating with the supporters, um, and then. Uh, we 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 had to, to to come down from that and and play the last number of games until you know we won the league as well. But it was a brilliant brilliant achievement. I'd, I think in the five years of Man United, there was we won the reserve league five or three out of the five years as well. So we was always used to you know success and winning trophies, albeit you know that that was at the reserve level. So to go and actually do it within league football was was absolutely brilliant. It would have been an amazing feeling. And in the summer of 1997, you did briefly touch upon it. He was offered a, a two year contract extension by Manchester United. But did the low of 15 football like Wigan persuade you away from signing that deal and, and, and joining the club? Because I imagine it would have been really tough to turn down that kind of offer from, like I said, one of the most successful clubs in England. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it, it was, there's no doubt it's difficult because you're, um, it's it's been your dream and and you know the, just the whole setup at, at, at Manchester United uh, was brilliant. But um, you you're at the stage and, and this is why whenever you go out and you play football and it's competitive and and you you end up winning the league, you want more of it. You know so that that whole thing surrounding um, achieving something and and obviously winning the trophy as well, it just gives you a taste for it, yeah. You know, and that's why now I, I had a conversation with the gaffer and we had, we had a good chat before we made that decision. But um, really, I was turning, I was 23 at the time. So it was, and I know it was probably a late developer and went over a bit or, or a bit later than others. But even so, at 23, I wanted to be out playing first team football at that stage. That's a really admirable answer. And for those people who, who may be listening or are watching and, and doesn't really know, about what that Latic squad were like at the time, would you be able to talk through the squad, um, who, with the players who you're close with, and obviously the biggest characters in the dressing room? Yeah, we did look during during those five years with loads of great, you know, big characters, you know, and and that's uh, teams that are are successful, you know, are usually filled with big characters, and and as well as that, they also, you know, when you, you have the social part of it, they actually get on together. You know that's that's a great mix. Um, I know there's there's been talk at times of you know teams that have been successful and and the players don't get on off the fields and that that happens. You're not going to get on with everybody, but generally, you know there was a there's a great group. So when I first went to the Wigan Athletic, you had obviously Colin Greenall, Colin Masur, um, you had Graham Jones as I say, Robbie, Izzy Diaz. Ian Kilford, Gavin Johnson, and then as we moved on, then you play players like Simon Hart, you had, um, Michael O'Neill came in, you had Chase, Darren Sheridan, Car Bradshaw, Scott Green, Roy Carl, you know, throughout there's you know there's quality players right there, David Lee, 
you know, they were, we, we had a really good side. And I know the five years as our, we, we were in the playoffs on three occasions and we just couldn't make that next step. And, you know, sometimes it's just not meant to be. I think the, the, the playoff final against Gillingham, where we were 2-1 up with about seven minutes to go and ended up losing 3-2, was, was gut wrench. And, you know, but um, I always felt that we were we were a strong enough squad and team to be, you know, the, the league above. And sometimes it just happens, sometimes it doesn't. And eventually it did happen, obviously, with Wigan Athletic as well. Yeah, I, I really resonate with that because uh, you could have the, the, the best team, but it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And you, you mentioned that the social side of things there and, and back in the 90s, it, it was probably more acceptable. Uh, feel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong for, for footballs to go out and obviously enjoy themselves a little bit more. Uh, as Andy Little said um, to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, not everyone was a journalist back then. So uh, how much did you enjoy the crack of a night out and, and what was your memories of King Street and Wigan in particular? <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, we obviously Manchester wasn't wasn't the great distance from Wigan, so we we lived in Manchester um, for for the first five years, and then you know we moved up to we moved to Standish, the village of Standish, and we had we had four great years there with with great people. So we had, we had brilliant neighbours alongside, obviously, the playing side of things, and um, so we had Manny's at Manny's a good night in, in Wigan, my, my wife and myself. You know, with both with friends and then with the social group with the players and that as well. I'd, I always tried my best and I, and I think again this might have been due to the fact that obviously with the issues surrounding Philip, whenever players from Ireland came over or even players that were, were just coming, trying to settle within a club, always tried to, to go out of my way to, to make them feel at home. You know, so Alan McLaughlin, when Macker came up, I was I was quite friendly with Mark as well, and you know, but we we had a great social group, and and yeah, many many's a, a good night in Wigan. Absolutely, King Street is a, a place that a lot of Wigan fans really enjoy visiting, and I'm sure as well there have been some great moments on nights out which cannot simply be aired on, on this kind of podcast. I, I'm sure there'll be some yeah. stories that'll be uh, took to the grave, uh, so to speak. And uh, in terms of the uh, the camaraderie of the Shroud Squad, what was the environment around the training ground and in training like? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the environment was, it was as I said, I had seven managers in the five years, sir. Yeah, so, you know, the, there was always there was always movement. And, and you know, the, the, the chairman, I have to say, Mr. Wynn, I, I got on the best one. You know, I, I think he was he's obviously instrumental in everything that Wigan have did and their movement through the leagues. But, you know, he was a brilliant man and that he, he called a spade a spade. And I like that with people. So, um, that, the, the the within the, the the group, I suppose, and within the, the changing room environment, it was always a real work ethic. When you went out to train, you trained and trained hard. And you know, there was sometimes things went on within the training ground that, that um it, it was quite volatile, but that's that's part and parcel of, of football and, and you know, me coming from a Gaelic background that's seen plenty of that anyway, you know, so um, it, it it's part and parcel of if you want to be successful. Sometimes you have to have to push that wee bit. Absolutely, and uh, I think I I'll never forgive myself if I don't ask you this question. It was revealed by Andy Liddell on the Athletic Supporters Mental Health Group Q and A. Can you recall the moment where yourself and Roy Carr had a bit of coming together? I know it shocked the the entire squad because uh, obviously we're close friends uh, throughout your time, Wigan. Yeah, look. Um, yeah, these are things. These are sort of these things that that, that happen within football. Um, you know, Roy and myself laugh about it now. You know, and are are still very friendly. And it, it's um, it was at the It's usually a Friday morning. We had the Friday morning games, and you know, you you say Friday morning games, and it's, it's supposed to take away from the bit of pressure as it builds toward us towards a Saturday. But even the, the Friday morning games aren't that friendly. So everybody. You know, when you're a winner, even in the, 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 the games, the, you want to win. And uh, we were just doing a game where you, you chip the ball and then it, it went to the other side and, and then your teammate had to go. And there were re, re races, but this particular morning, I think Roy was messing about a bit and I was in his team and, and told him the, the, the ways up. And uh, he, he told me where to go. And I said, um, look, Roy, uh, I says, you know, you're letting your... your teammates down here and he again 
told me where to go and I told him not to tell me where to go once more. <laughs> and when, he didn't get the, the opportunity to say it again whenever he, he tried to get it out of his mouth. And, and let's just say there was a coming together and, and Roy went, went to the ground. And um, the, the, the funny thing about this, and we can laugh about it now, myself and Roy, but the funny thing about it was when, when Roy hit, hit the ground and then was sort of stumbling back up, Bruce Riach, who was manager at the time, Bruce turned around and he says, play on. <laughs> and just that, as, as if nothing had happened. You know, so, um, but like the, that was Friday, the, the following day, and we were playing in a match. I think it was maybe Wrexham the following day, and, and um, Roy got into another bit of a tangle with one of their players, and, and I was the first one to, to stick up for him. You know, so these are things that happen in, a, in a, a training, you know, training environment, especially when it's, you know, there's a lot of. The, there's a lot at stake and even in training you know you're, you're trying to put you're, you're trying to do your best both personally and, and for the team so Alec it's yeah Lids I don't know what Lids um, I, I didn't listen <laughs> to what Lids said about it and those darn shared and shares have talked about it as well but um, Alec we got over it you know but the lads had a good laugh about it Absolutely and it, it's a great story that Andy Little told on the, on the episode because I think it's with the competitive nature of professional football, it's bound to happen eventually. You're always going to clash heads every now and again. And during your time at Wigan, this was a, a great memory for different, different reasons. It's quite entertaining. It's probably not the, the funnest of memories, but you have plenty more great memories. In the 1998 to 1999, you won the Football League trophy. What do you remember from this day and, and how special was that? Oh, look, I mean, again, gr growing up, you know, I'd have watched... FA Cup finals and you know the the walking out on to the, the the pitch at Wembley. So to actually get there and you know playing against the, you know it was Millwall were were a good side at that stage. You know the Tim Kale, Stephen Reid, you know they they had a good side and you know, it's just all the overriding memory is, is getting into the the changing rooms initially. You know going into the tunnel and then getting off into the changing rooms. It was you know quite an old stadium at that stage yeah but the the change rooms were massive you know and then just the, the build up to the game going out before you know the warm-up and just going and having a look around the stadium um and then obviously then walking out uh when it came to the game and then seeing the crowds and it was a lovely day that particular day as well and and then just getting on with the game you know which which wasn't a, it certainly wasn't a classic game but you know, Paul, like Dodger came up trumps and they end up, you know, and, and scored probably at the best possible time towards, you know, in the last couple of minutes of the game. What was it like to parade the trophy in front of the uh, Travelling Wicked supporters? Oh, brilliant. I mean, the, we had a, quite a, a, a crowd came over from, from Lurgan as well, you know, so friends and family came over. So being able to, to share that with them as well was, was terrific. And I know this the support from Wigan was, was certainly a lot smaller than the, the Millwall support, but but it was a very genuine support and it was great to, to give it back to them as well. Is there anything from Wigan uh, during your time as a player that you'll never forget? Oh, look, I mean, the, the, obviously the, the, the goal against Colchester was a big one. I think also the final game, the final league game at Springfield Park, um, where we beat Chesterfield three one and I scored the, the 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 third goal in that one, which was a, when I think about it, a, it was a, the final late goal scored at Springfield Park. So you know, if things like that, the, you know, the two two appearances at, at, at Wembley, um, they can never be taken away, at you, and they're they're things that will always be etched as as very very strong memories, you know. How do you remember moving from Springfield Park to the Stadium in 1999? Um, it was, yeah, look, I mean, it was a bit of, bit of transition, you know, the, the go from Springfield to the, the brand new 25,000 seater stadium at, at JJB was, you know, took a little bit of getting used to, but um, footballers are footballers. Once you get out on that pitch, you know, you, you still have an area of green with white lines on it and you you just you get on with it but definitely there's there's 
different stadiums that I've been in. You know, some have been older stadiums, some have been new. Um, and you know, Springfield there was a great feeling to it in terms of the atmosphere when you were you were playing, even though it didn't have you know the newness of the JJB. Absolutely, it was it was it was such a big move in the, in the history of Wigan Athletic and. Are you proud, obviously, knowing where, where the club has, what the club has achieved over the years, that, that you played a part in, in their rise to the Premier League, to winning the FA Cup, to playing in Europe? Yeah, look, I've, I've always been proud of the, of the things that are achieved within football, but especially with two clubs that I think are a, a really good fabric to them. You know, both Manchester United and Wigan Athletic, that's why. And, and I, I often say this, it was probably at a time in my life where you know, after Philip's death, Jay, as well, that I just need, I needed stability. You know, I needed stability more than anything um, because we're working in the area of mental health. You find that a lot of issues relating to negative mental health is, is about, you know, the instability that you have. Um, so that side of things was always, you know, that it was hugely important to, to have played a part in it. And, even now, I, I keep an eye on, on results and I went over, you know, the first game with the, the, when they, they reached the Premier League, I went over to the game. I went to the FA Cup final as well. Um, with and actually, that, yeah, there was, I mean, there was a story to that because we had been away at, uh, I think it was Lanzarote and arrived in at 12 o'clock that, that Friday evening. Um, so basically Saturday morning and got in the, the bed for literally two hours and had to get up at two o'clock in the morning to go over to London to, to then to go to the, the FA Cup final. So myself and, and Bernadette and the kids, we brought them all and my mum and dad as well. Um, and Bernadette's mum and dad as well. So, the, you know, we, 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 the support from Lurgan that day when it was the FA Cup final as well. So, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed supporting them even after finishing playing. I love to talk about the FA Cup final and you've just given me the perfect opportunity to do that. So how did it feel uh, for you and your family when, when Ben Watson headed home that famous goal in the 91st minute against Manchester City to defy all odds to win the FA Cup? Oh, look, it was a, it was an amazing feeling. It was an amazing day because, you know, just to, to, to think that a club like, like Wigan and Fladdock were playing against Manchester City in the FA Cup final and, and it was the... Uh, the chairman and, and I suppose Robbie's dream as well. You know that was that was amazing. I, I was sat, we were sat more or less in line with um, the goal. And so at, at that stage, so it was at the side we we were sat at the side where the corner was coming in from, and just seeing that obviously Ben Watson then you know getting his head to it and scoring and I suppose not giving a little bit like the the Paul Rogers one. You know there wasn't much time to regroup after that for Man City. Uh, so it was a it was a perfect time to score, and it's just it's something that again can't be taken away. You know, if you're a Wigan Athletic supporter or or player, former player. How delighted was you for Dave Whelan? Because obviously he's someone you you worked under and you played under during your time at Wigan, and and obviously you was there when he when his goals and dreams were first coming to life with the form in Oldfield Stadium. But then it, it it just obviously went to to where it went. Yeah, look, it was brilliant for him. As I, as I said earlier, you know, I always got on with Mr. Whelan. I thought he was, you know, even in the final year. Um, and obviously with myself and, and Paul, Paul Jewell, we didn't, I suppose, <laughs> towards the end of things, you know, I, I was having to I'd put myself on the, the, the list. And, and because I'd put myself on the list, it, it didn't work out in the final season at Wigan Athletic. It was no, there was nothing personal between myself and Paul. But I always remember at the end of that season. Um, I think it was maybe Colchester was the final game of the season. But I was on the bench for that game, and and Mister Wheel made a beeline and and came over and shook my hand and wished me all the best for you know for whatever I was I was gonna do next. And I thought that you know it was typical of him because as much as he's a businessman and as much as you know he could be. I'd not say abrupt, yeah, I suppose direct at times, yeah, but there was still a, a lot of goodness in him, and you know, for what he what he did for Wigan Athletic was amazing. Absolutely, well, you touched on it briefly there, but in your final year at Wigan Athletic, it was it was also Paul Jones' first season, and it was a season of transition at the club. So, can you talk through what happened throughout that season that obviously led to to your departure? 
Yeah, I mean, it was it, the, the season before that Steve Bruce, Brucey had had been manager, you know, for the, the the last few games of that season and got us into the playoffs. We we were very unlucky, you know, against Reading in the, in the playoff semis. And I expect that I've had conversations with, with Steve Bruce about, you know, signing a, a new deal because I was playing week in, week out within the team and a, a year left. And, you know, when you're getting to the other stages of your career, Jay, at 20, at 29, you know, you need you need a bit of security. So we had verbally agreed, you know, on, on a new deal if he was coming in as manager. But then he didn't take over as manager and I went and spoke to Paul Jewell and he said he wouldn't be giving me uh, a contract until... You know, he's seen me playing and, and, you know, which is his prerogative. That's the way it was. But I had to, to look at it from a family's point of view as well. And, and I told him that, it, you know, I'd be putting myself on the list, but I would continue to work hard and, and, and try and keep in the, in the team. But it was just in case if something came about that they could let me know. Uh, I, I certainly didn't want to the, the really leave the, the club at the time. But, you know, this is part and parcel of football and it's... Um, so that year, I played the majority of games, and then I, I got injured towards, um, you know, just it would have been after Christmas, and then the side was doing well, and I was again, I was mainly on the bench towards the end of the season. I, I went out alone to Scunthorpe, Jay, and and had a good run at Scunthorpe. They offered to the the sign me, but. I just didn't think it was it was worth it for my family, you know, when I went to Scunthorpe and, and um, decided then against it and just played the season. I, I'd already, you know, poured it down, had, had shown an interest in me going back and I finished my physio degree. So I had that to fall back on as well. So that was where, where it went. And in the final, you know, number of games I was on the bench but didn't, didn't play. But again, that's part and parcel of football. Absolutely. It's a uh, during your time, like you mentioned it earlier, you're playing under seven managers in five years. Which manager did you enjoy playing under the most? Um I, I have to say I thought I thought Ray Mathias Ray, Ray was very, very good, you know, in, in, in a really good way about him. And he's just a genuinely nice, nice man. You know, that's the thing. And he but he, he got results with the players as well, I have to say. Um Bruce Riak, I thought Bruce I got on well. Bruce he, again, he was very disciplined in what he did and he wanted his players to be disciplined but I, I related to that in the, in the you know in a football environment so those are two but every manager that I had did all their own you know characteristics and but they would probably be the two that would stand out and, and certainly the other one the certain one the other one would be John Day and John brought me in and again another genuinely you know a really nice man so um, I I I always took, you know, always took things from from all the managers. It's uh, some really great names there. I know uh, Bruce Rioch is someone will be very familiar with the fans as well with the other names because obviously Bruce Rioch's son Gregor is currently doing a great job as the head of the academy in current state of affairs like Athletic. And uh, after spending uh, two years with Potter Down playing back in Ireland between 2002 and 2004, uh, I might have got the date slightly wrong there, if, if so, my mistake. But you signed for Glen Torr and, and picked up an Irish Premier League winners' medal in your first season. How did you find your maiden year at Glen Torr? Yeah, look, I really enjoyed it. I have to say, I, I was I was at Porter Down in the, the final season there, which was 2003 2004. Um, I was captain in the side, you know, and, and we, again, the, the second year, Jay, we were. We were hot in the heels of Linfield, who were top, and it actually went down to the very last day of, of the season. We needed to we needed to beat the, uh, our local rivals Glenavon three 0 and we needed Linfield to get beaten by Glentoran um, for us to win the league. So uh, we we did our end of the bargain. We won three 0 but Linfield unfortunately beat uh, Glentoran. So so they won the league with three points that season, and it. I thought with me captain on the side and I went in and spoke to the manager uh, about, you know, what was happening. The offer that they made me uh, for for me captain on the side, I didn't think it was worth it. And then obviously then signed for Glentoran under Roy Coy. So I have to say he was really, really professional in the way that he went about things. And, and he got a great group together that, that particular season. 
Um, it went down to the wire again in that, that final season. And I think with a couple of games to go, we, we played Linfield. And it, it's now called it's called Chris Morgan Day, and rightly so, because Chris scored the, the, the winner and the, more or less the last kick of the ball. And it meant that we had to go into the final game and win, you know, win it to win the league, which we did. So that, that season, you know, there was a lot of firsts within that day. We had, we, as well as winning the league, we won the, the CIS Cup, which is, you know, like not the, the biggest cup, cup competition, but the second. So we won it. We got the semi final of the Irish Cup as well. We, I think, we won a um, European tie for the first time and a way tie for the first time in their history. You know, with a really good side. Um, and I always said, you know, before I finished and, and, and hung up the, the boots, I wanted to win a, a league title in, in Northern Ireland as well. So at least I achieved that. Absolutely. And what was the circus that said that led to you hanging up your boots? Um, the, the second year, what happened was the the first year at Glentorn, especially the last 10 games, yeah, I was... I was getting pain killing the Jacksons into my knee before 10 minutes or 15 minutes before every game just to see me, see me through. Um, and after the, the, the season was finished, then I was due to go for an operation. Now, there was a bit of an issue in, in regards to the, not the club. Now, you know, because I, I, I always have utmost respect for, for Glenn Tord. Um, but there was a certain individual that me and him just blocked horns. And after that, the, whenever I did come back from my injury and my operation, it was never, the, it wasn't the same that particular season. So my motivation had gone at that stage, Jay. And, and that's when I, I made the decision then to, to step away from it. I, I just played locally and started on my, my coaching badges. And uh, obviously you receive your coaching badges and you actually turn your hand to, to management in 2006. And it, it always went full circle as uh, the first job you had as a manager was your local team, Lurgan. So how was that experience? And, and how did you find your time in management for, for Lurgan, Monaghan United, Neary City and Porter Down between, between 2006 and 2016? Um, yeah, look, I mean, it was... Again, the, the coaching and management side of things have sort of fell into it. I definitely enjoyed my, my, my time. The, the first year at Lurgan Celtic, the manager had stepped away and I then took over as player manager and managed to, to, to win promotion with that, that group. So again, we had a really good group. And then somebody approached me from Monaghan United um, to, to go in as an assistant with the, the idea to take over as manager. So I went. The, the Monaghan United and they had a really good group. Um, they had a, they were playing in like the Eritrea or Con League, as they call it. And the, um, but they had part time players, but with a full time mentality, and it was great to take training. It really was. Um, so I had a had a stint there, and then went to New York City, where I was in the year that I had with them. I was very, you know, was successful. Um, then at New York City went there then to Portadown as manager. So it, it was a difficult time at, at Portadown. Um the you know there's a lot of issues off the field as well as on the field. Um but I managed to I, I took over before the end of the, the, the season and, and managed to, to keep them up when really they were in free fall. So that was actually one of my, what I would say was major successful start success stories within management. Um, because there was so much going on off the field that, that supporters and that wouldn't have known. So, but at that stage, I was I was working, doing a lot of works around in the mental health and with trying to be smart. And I always remember saying that if it came to the decision between Porter Down and trying to be smart, my heart lay in, in, in trying to be smart. And that's where I decided then to, to take the step away um, and sort of, Midway through the, the following season at Portadown, because there was a twelve point they, they got a twelve point deduction, Jay, from and they also then had a further three point deduction taken. So it wasn't that we weren't allowed to sign any professional players. We had to sign amateur players. It was a it wasn't a level playing field at all. So 
Um, a step away, and in all honesty, I'm, I'm certainly not missing it. I'm not missing it. But I love the work that I'm doing at the moment. It's some really admirable work, and and we will get on to that. And to link back to your management career, have you got any special memories from your time as a manager? Uh, I know there's a very special story, including Sir Alex Ferguson. Yeah, look, I mean, in times within within management, I suppose the the Newry the Newry City one in particular that that year where. I took over. They went into the the championship from the, the the Premier League, and I took over there as as manager. And basically, was left with with two players, yeah, from the the previous season, and just built a, a group along with the, you know the great management team. They were they were local lads. The lad that's now manager of Newry, Darren Mullen, was the, one of the staff, and they they got a lot of local base players in. And there was a great camaraderie in the in the whole group, and we end up we got to the playoffs. We really should have went up. We we played the team from the division above, and over the two legs, we were by far the better team. But just you know, we could we couldn't score, and that and that that was our, our downfall over the two legs. But as well as that, got to the semi final of the Irish Cup, won the Mid Ulster Cup, won the Intermediate Cup. Um, you know, it was a really good, productive season. So that would probably be a standout for, you know, within management. It's a, a really great achievement. And how would you reflect on your football career as a whole? And we've not touched on it too, but you also won seven caps for Northern Ireland during your playing career. And obviously it's a great, the greatest ever honour to, to play for your country. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the when I look back, you know, to, to, to be coming from from Lurgan and, and, and starting out playing and playing for your local sides to then make that, you know, step to actually be at a club like Manchester United for five years to play international football at the very highest level, you know, is something that's that, you know, you read about it in, in books, but you don't really think it will happen. So I'm nothing only really proud of, you know, sometimes as footballers, we don't, uh, you, when when you're playing, you don't really have the chance, so you don't look back too often. But it's only when you get the chance and you you've finally hung up the the boots, certainly at a professional level, that you then can reflect on it and look at some of the pictures and some of the videos and realize, you know, it was yeah, it was it was nice, more than nice to do. You know, it was just a it was just a dream come true. Would you do anything differently in career looking back? No, I, I don't have, have many regrets in, in that that way because you know I don't think it's worth it. Um, you that, again from a from a mental health perspective, it's, you know it's not good to have, have too many regrets. Yes, it can be a learning process, but in football in particular, there's there's ups and downs. You know, every week, every month. You know, and I'm sure that you know the Wigan Athletic supporters are experiencing that. You know, at, at, over the last year and, and beyond. So, they, from a football perspective, no, I, I try not to have many regrets. That's more understandable. And you mentioned Wigan Athletic there. You've you've been an active member since last July of the Wigan Athletic Supporters Mental Health Group. Have you enjoyed that experience and being able to interact with the fans on a on a one to one close basis? Yeah, look, it's it's brilliant. I think you know, I I talk around. Um, the area of mental health, uh, uh, you know, about the whole social media sphere and, and how it's used and what it's used for positive means. I think I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, I, I don't add things in there too often, but that's because you know I'm I'm very busy and do, doing a lot of work. But it's not to say that I'm I'm not taking it in. You know, and and a lot of the work we do surrounds the whole five steps to well being. And you know, whenever I started trying to be smart in the charity and giving something back to the community, there was it's a great feeling, and I think it's the same with this group. You know, groups like these are are supporting each other. They're you know, they, they there's there's humour in it. There's there's all of the things that will will give people, I suppose, a lift whenever they maybe need it. Absolutely, and. Uh... With the Wing Athletic Support Mental Health Group, there's a lot of fun activities. There's a lot of Zoom events, and there's also uh, picture quizzes, which I, I know your wife Bernadette really enjoyed taking part in one of the quizzes uh, to a point where you was a little bit frustrated in a way. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I think it was a Friday night, and it was at a stage like where um, she's so busy doing the quiz that she's not speaking to me. And <laughs> but <laughs> these things, these things happen, yeah. So. Um, no, it was only a bit of tongue in cheek, but really, you know, the, I, I just think it's it's brilliant work, and and 
that that's the the really positive thing about you know the social media outlets and especially for the likes of the, the Wigan Athletic groups. Absolutely, and uh, in in terms of your mental health work, what are the five steps to well being for for those who may not know? Right, so the, the five steps. So they're basically being active is one. You know, we talk about the physical activity. Um, taking notice is another. Uh, so it's it's basically around taking notice of all the things and all the good that's around, and that's why I talk about you know going to your local park and going for not necessarily for a brisk walk, even just. A, a, a nice leisurely walk and taking in the things around you know it's also about connecting you know so the big one is that you don't become isolated and, and again whether that's um whether that's on the likes of a zoom which we are or whether that's you know in in real life to, to keep that connection is important um, so give and and that's what I said about the charity work you know giving back to the community or giving back to another group and and the final one when this is a huge one is and this this surrounds mental health uh, is learn new things you know because learning new things it, it, it used to be thought that you know from the age of of 18 and adulthood or the, you know 18 to 20 and adulthood that that was you your your brain was fixed and and the way that your brain worked but it's since been shown with this thing called neuroplasticity that you can you can regrow areas of your brain at any stage you know just by learning new things and then making it become habit you know so these the, 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 it's a it's a brilliant five steps and it's and it's quite a simple way um but it's also uh I think it's it's a very real way, Jay, the you know, for, for people to take it in because obviously you can go into a very into it in a deep way in terms of the psychiatry of it, but even just knowing those five simple steps will will help with your, your well being. Absolutely. And how how's your how's your work been affected over the last twelve months with the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, it's it's been difficult because you know our teams. We have fourteen affiliated teams, Jay, and, and the, the the range from under seven right through to under seventeen. So that's not been going on. The the facility, which we have two indoor pitches as well as as various workshop rooms, and it's all stopped at the minute. So that that's difficult, and you know. Um, but I have to say, the first lockdown in, in last March, you know. The, the weather was good, so at least I could get out of the garden and do a lot. And at the minute, you know, you're starting to see the, the stretch in the evenings and the early mornings. And I think that gives everybody a, a lift as well. So hopefully things will open up, you know, soon enough and, and we'll be able to get back to some sort of normality. Absolutely. It's been absolutely fantastic, Pat, to have you on our podcast. You've been excellent and really insightful in your time as a player, but also in mental health. Before we end this episode, have you got anything you'd like to add or, or mention? Look, no, I mean, uh, as I say, I, I keep, you know, I, I keep a great interest in, in Wigan Athletic generally, you know, and, and we, we still have friends over there that we will go over to, especially, you know, once the, this, everything starts to open up. Um, so it, it's really, it's been a pleasure to, to, to get a chat. It's always important to, to, as I say, I keep connected. And I think football gives people that, I think it gives people a purpose and a hope and I think you know with, with Wigan Athletic the, the fabric's there so it's a matter of just keeping that going Absolutely, it's in, in, in true Wigan Athletic say it's about keeping the faith keep believing and we'll defy the odds again and we'll, we'll obviously always rise to the top in, in times of adversity Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about that and I mean if if you look at the, the, the rise through, through the leagues you know Dave Whelan and, and, and the club generally showed, you know, so much resilience within this. And it's just, it's been a, it's been a t- testing and very challenging time for the club. But hopefully, you know, it, it'll make it all the, all the sweeter when they come out the other end of it then.